accurate. Um, you are in the panel on Black Jewish relations, um, otherwise known as it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Um, and we uh, we chatted this morning, and, and we want to do I think the same format today. Uh, so let me just introduce it, introduce our panelists, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for discussions and shared experiences from you all uh, at the community level. So I um, just want to frame this by, you know, really that, that phrase was worst times, best of times. We like to think and romanticize the civil rights days as, you know, as Bob said earlier, when, you know, Heschel and Martin Luther King walked together as like, you know, that was the hate day. But, you know, that wasn't so great either. Uh, and there were issues. Um, and I think the relationship uh, between the black and the Jewish community, for the most part, has been a very positive one based on shared values and shared interests. I know from my experience in Boston, I see my successor back there in the last row, Jeremy Burton, who has continued that, that, that we, proximity and relationship was sort of paramount. And what I tried to do, and I know Jeremy has continued, uh, and I should say I'm Nancy Kaufman, I was the Boston JCIC director for 20 years, and NCJW uh, CEO for the last nine years, and uh, now doing coaching and consulting in uh, the Jewish world and beyond. Uh, and um, so I, this is near and dear to my heart, because I feel like what we did in Boston uh, early on was to really develop meaningful, serious relationships based on not dialogue, but on actually doing work together. Uh, and whether it was affordable health care or housing or, or whatever the issue was, that we found common cause with African Americans in our community. And by building those relationships in the tough times for us, whether it was around anti-Semitism or Israel or whatever else, we had relationships and therefore it was a no-brainer that we would support one another. If it was violence in, in, the, in the city or whatever it was, we were there for each other. That's not to say there weren't bumps along the road. There were always bumps along the road, and we'll talk about some of the bumps and some of the changes. But I think we should, we should ground this in, in the understanding that this is, this is an ebb and a flow, and the issues have ebbed and flow. Issues around um, whether it was civil rights movement, was voting rights, um, demographic changes in the cities, affirmative action, gun violence, reproductive justice led by um, African American women, um, affordable health care, and so on. These were issues that we engaged with uh, together. And so um, I think we need to sort of, as we look at this and we look at the times that we're in now, think of it really in, 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 the large, in a large frame. Um, and I want to just add the, the lens here that for whatever reasons, and those are complicated, and we'll talk a little bit about those as well, it's only been in the last several years that we have acknowledged as a majority white Jewish community that we too are diverse and that there are uh, Jews of color in our midst. It's funny because when we used to take non-Jews to Israel, which many of you do, I always was struck by, they were always struck and always said like, oh, not all Jews look alike. You know, they don't look like the Jews we know in, in our community. So, uh, you know, it seemed like Israel was able to put forward the fact, although they don't do it that well all the time, in terms of how they treat their Mizrahi and Ethiopian uh, citizens of Israel and their Arab citizens of Israel. But that in terms of the Jewish community, that there has always been diversity. Just as, by the way, there's diversity in the black community. And we'll talk about that, too. That they're not monolithic. Uh, in terms of the documents. So um, it's important that we think about who's the we and uh, what do we mean by we uh, and what do we mean by being in relationship with. So that's some of the stuff we're going to talk about. So it's against that backdrop I want to introduce our panelists and uh, get on with the, with the discussion. So they're each going to present for about five, seven minutes, then we're going to open it up to all of you. We'll take a few questions at a time and we'll have a conversation. So we're going to start off with Carly Pildes. Um, her bio is in your app, but uh, just the headline is she's a contributing editor for Tablet Magazine mm -hmm. and is known as an advocate for justice and equality, both nationally and globally. And she's going to start us off by discussing some of the insights she recently shared in her Tablet Magazine article entitled, In Light of Rising Anti-Semitism, Rethinking Black Jewish Relations. Mm -hmm. uh, she'll be followed by Bob Kaplan. Uh, Bob is the director of the Center for Community Leadership at New York's JCRC. 
and acts both as an internal and external consultant to many diverse uh, communities both within and beyond the Jewish community, uh, and he is known as an expert in intergroup relations and capacity building for local grassroots uh, organizations. And then uh, Rabbi Shai Smishon, we're very happy you made it on that horrible bus from New York. I told him, only take the train. Uh, uh, a, uh, rabbi Rishon is a Brooklyn-based Orthodox rabbi and author known to many as Manishtana. Um, so, mm -hmm. without further ado, Carly, why don't you start us off? I'm going to yes. kind of time you and give you a minute's notice, and I'll try to be consistent and not have the buzzer go off, but just you know, let you know when your time is I'm good with buzzers. You can just you get, get the Oscar and his band to play okay. me off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the, the buzz will go off at six minutes, and you'll have one more minute so that we have a chance for everyone to speak. All right. I come to this issue, at, first of all, let me just say I'm honored to be on this panel. It's great to be here with two really esteemed colleagues, uh, and thanks for having me. I come to this issue as the mother of a three-year-old black Jewish girl and as the wife of a black Jewish man. I come to it as, you know, the only person in my immediate family who has access to white privilege and all the things it brings, uh, and who has seen firsthand living in that type of home uh, you know, it's an educational experience. It really shows you what you have and what the rest of your family does not in a pretty stark and heartbreaking way. So we've had a rough couple weeks as a Jewish community, uh, particularly for my colleagues here who live in New York. Um, a really frightening time in Crown Heights and throughout the Southern New York City region. I was at the No Hate, No Fear March, an incredible event. And one thing that people kept coming to me with and asking is, you know, we had two domestic terror attacks against the Jewish community with lives lost, perpetrated by black individuals. What does that mean for black Jewish relations? And I told them, substantively, I believe it means nothing. The black Jewish relations are fundamentally strong, and while there's room for improvement and room to deepen them, they are fundamentally strong. There are 40 million plus black Americans. They should not in any way be judged by the actions of three people. And that there's no data, no evidence to suggest that there's any sort of political force or organized force behind those attacks, making them distinct from white nationalist attacks that we know are a growing organized movement. Really important distinctions. So what do we do now? Uh, if we want to strengthen relations, build them, we, I think, take this moment as a moment, as an opportunity to learn, to listen, to grow, to invest, to double down. We start by condemning violence. Violence against black Americans, violence against Jewish Americans, violence against people. Luckily for us, there has been widespread condemnation of anti-Semitic violence by leaders of the black community, including the current and past president of the NAACP, Cornell Brooks actually put out three statements, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, <coughs> President Cheryl Iffen, every black member of Congress, and every black senator. And for those of you concerned about anti-Semitism on the left, in which I would certainly include myself, we also saw on the left Mark Lamont Hill, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, and Anthony Beckford of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn, all making a point of raising their voices on anti-Semitism. So, there's a good starting place here in that we saw widespread condemnation of violence and you know, a widespread desire to talk about anti-Semitism and growing anti-Semitism. I think the next thing we need to do is center on those who are most affected, and that is ultimately black Jews and their families. So these are the people, and I want to applaud the JCPA for doing this, who need to be centered, who need to be elevated at the institutional level, at the grassroots level, and really being heard and called upon to speak. Um, I think if we miss that, we miss the whole thing. Next is dialogue. I, I think at the legislative level, and this is Washington, so I get pretty stuck in that if I'm not careful. Um, at the legislative level, we have achieved enormous amounts as a coalition. If you go to any social justice focused lobby day, if you go to any sort of big push on health care or voting rights or gun control, you'll see black Jewish coalition work happening at a very high level. Where we have stumbled 
is opportunities for grassroots dialogue and institutional dialogue that is off the record, that is off the internet, that gives people a chance to ask hard questions, to have hard conversations, to perhaps ask questions that they're worried are too offensive to ask, and have the opportunity to learn and educate um, and, and be together, have quality contact, not just contact, but quality contact. And to do that not once, not at one black Jewish Seder that we all have a grand time at, then we all go home and talk about how just to see we are, um, but to do it regularly and, and really have space to do that. Um, and to do it in a way that gives people the chance to really ask questions and learn. So there's the dialogue sense. And the last part is really being uncompromising in our moral conviction and in our togetherness. A couple weeks ago, I heard Wade Henderson speak, and he was talking about the fight to pass hate crimes legislation. Now, many of us now take that for granted, but it took 13 years to pass the bill. And he talked about how they had so many opportunities to pass the bill if they were willing to cut out gay people, the queer community in its entirety, or cut women from the legislation. And every time they said no. And I said to him after, how did you do that? I've been in Washington for 10 years. That's not how I was trained to lobby. I was trained that you take the deal that you have, and then you go back and you get more next year. Mm -hmm. How did you do that? And how did you know it was the right thing to do? Now it seems obvious because you got the bill, but what if it had taken 30 years? You know, how did you know? And he said, we just did. We just knew that we ha could not sell out anyone in our coalition to get a bill. We just wouldn't do it. And it made our relationship stronger. It made us stronger politically. And in the end, we won. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot in these past couple of weeks because I think we're very much in that moment right now. Where we have to decide who we are. And, you know, hate crimes are tragedies. They're also opportunities to decide who we are and who we want to be. Now, when we talk about... I have a minute, right? You have a minute left. Perfect. <laughs> My family has had our issues with the police. We've had very frightening experiences. None that came to violence, but pretty close. And, um, you know, the police brutality component of this cannot be ignored. We cannot be in a place where we decide that Jewish security is sort of over the police brutality issue. If we get to a place where we decide that we're okay if our black neighbors are profiled or our black neighbors are beaten or our black neighbors are, you know, victim to detrimental policies because we think it makes our community safer to have more police, we don't worship Hashem anymore. We worship Moloch. It's not just a threat to our... It's not just a threat to black Jewish kids. It's not just a threat to people of color who are afraid of police and have good reason to be. It's a threat to our souls. It's a threat fundamentally to who we are as a community. So when I talk about standing together in the face of growing anti-Semitism, growing racism, hate crimes, and violence, we cannot decide that halfway solutions that make some communities feel safe and other communities feel terrified are the way to go. Everyone's kids matter. Everyone matters. So. We have to condemn violence, we need to center on those most affected, create real spaces for dialogue, while we continue to work on the policy work, of course, and be uncompromising in our standing together and refusing to accept easy solutions that hurt portions of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Bob. So, <clears throat> got a question for you. Got a question for you. How do you, as a Jew, feel when you see a police car parked in front of your local city? Safer. Safer, right? How do you think that the local black folk in the community that come up and see a police car parked in front of their church? Scared. Scared. We feel comfortable with police, and we think that that's a solution to the issue of anti-Semitism. We're going to either secure it or we're going to law enforcement it away on some levels. And in the African, Caribbean, and other communities that I interface with in New York, and I just want to make this rejoinder right from the beginning. I'm talking to a New York lens. And I'm, I just, 
don't know how, however to approach the issue, hopefully what we'll be able to do together is take those, those New York paradigms and bring them into your reality because they, for all intents and purposes, they really are there. So that's something we have to be very well aware of. What we think are priority issues and priority areas of focus just are not areas of focus and priorities for a lot of the communities that we're interfacing with, particularly the African American, Caribbean American, and other communities. And that's another thing we need to understand. We tend to lump everyone together. We, talk, we tend to lump our Jewish community together, and we certainly tend to lump the other communities together. So I've got another question for you. What's the largest growing segment of the quote unquote black community of New York? Anybody know? African immigrants? African immigrants, and it's amazing that you were able to answer. In the Washington area. So you live in the Washington area. So it's African Muslims moving into the Bronx in the hundreds of thousands. Hmm. Below the radar screen. People are not aware of it. Unless you are in the communities and hearing people's narratives and figuring out what's going on and where things are changing. And that's really ultimately what needs to be done. I've been doing this now for a whole bunch of years, and my job over at JCRC, which is uh, mentioned before, is the, it's now called the Center for Community Leadership. It was originally <coughs> called the Commission, everything was a commission back then, the, the, it was in the, 1993, the Commission on Intergroupulations and Community Concerns. I had no idea what that meant. No idea what that meant, but I did know that in the summer of 1991, there was, and depending upon whose lens you're looking through, there was a riot, or a pogrom, or a social uprising in Crown Heights. And that's another important tool you need to bring into this work. You have to be willing to look through the other lenses that are approaching the issues that you're integrating yourself into, that you're connecting to, that you want to be part of. And you can't always look through your lens, because that's a real danger point. Because if you're looking only through your lens, you're only seeing your particular narrative around the issue, and you are violating the narrative of the others who are engaged in these issues. And once we begin to violate the narrative of the other and say that they are just not correct, <coughs> or they're not true, or some other words that I've heard to use to describe it, we have now not lent dignity to that narrative. By the way, lending dignity to a narrative doesn't mean you have to agree with it. It means you just got to live to it. And you have to understand that that narrative is as profound and as important to the communities that we're interfacing with as your narrative is to you. That's an important piece. So when I began my work in Crown Heights uh, 27 years ago, and I know that Jeremy is in the back, so you sort of remember some of this stuff, Crown Heights was 95% African Caribbean American, and about 5% Jewish, primarily Lubavitch. 15 years earlier, it was 95% white, primarily Jewish, Italian, and Irish. That was the white ethnic groups of those days. And a smaller number, obviously, of African Americans. We're talking about community changes. And we're going through such huge community changes because today, Crown Heights is the fastest gentrifying community in New York City. And what we think will happen in the next five to ten years, it will become a majority white community. But not majority Lubavitch, not majority Jewish, although there are probably a lot of Jews there. But they won't be the kind of Jews that folks expected to be in that community. It's going to be others. Because between 1950, excuse me, 20,000 uh, and 10, <coughs> 2015, in migration into New York City by young white folks coming in from different parts of the country actually outstripped immigration. And guess where they moved? They moved primarily into African American communities throughout New York City and primarily in Brooklyn. So Bed-Stuy, Bedford-Stuyvesant, which you now have you know, television shows about on Netflix and Amazon and all that kind of stuff, or Williamsburg where you have was it two broke girls living in those communities, those used to be communities that were the spiritual, cultural, religious, and other homes of the African American community where those communities no longer are seeing a future in those communities. So for instance, a good friend of mine, his name is Reverend Lawrence Aker, he owns Cornerstone, uh, owns, works at Cornerstone, owns, but works at Cornerstone Baptist Church. 
You used to get 2,000 people every Sunday morning. If he gets 250, he's doing well. Why? Because young and other folks are moving into his community, seeing a brownstone that a black family bought in the 1980s and 1990s when the whole area is redlined and you couldn't get a mortgage on the thing, built a community, built a structure, built a church, built everything, and now selling it for 2.5 to $3 million. And folks are leaving New York from that community in large numbers as they retire out and go south. They move to South Carolina or North Carolina or other parts of the country. Certainly with a lot of money, but with a deep sense of loss of the communities that they had created and were part of. And that's happening all throughout the city. And the amount of or the depth of, of, of uh, hopelessness in communities well, I'm going to tell you one other thing. So, for instance, you, you all heard of the anti-Semitic attack that happened in Brooklyn, right? Brooklyn. It's all in Brooklyn, right? Where these communities interface. And by the way, the majority of the folks that they are interfacing with are primarily ultra-Orthodox because almost 50% of the Jewish population of New York City is ultra-Orthodox. <coughs> and that's who they're, they're interfacing with. So, when the rabbi was hit in the head with a brick, in Crown Heights, a mile or two away in Brownsville, the day before, the day after, and I don't remember, it really doesn't make a difference, 10 people were shot and one person was killed. One made national headlines and one went under the radars. There was a little story about it, but that was it. But it didn't become a rallying cry for all these resources and czars against hate and all this other kind of stuff. So the messaging that's coming back from communities is that I'm sure to get I'm sort of getting the short end of the stick. This is perception. And perception is as true to these communities in their narrative as our perceptions are as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm Rabbi Rabbi Michelle. Another black guy. <laughs> so I come to this work as a professional black Jewish person. Um, not only uh, in a decade of working on writing and speaking on racial and religious identity and how that intersection tends to specifically manifest around American Judaism, uh, but also as an Orthodox, ugh, an Orthodox uh, black Jew with two Orthodox black Jewish parents. And my mother's family has been here African and Amer African American and Jewish since the 1780s. Uh, I grew up Chabad, then I got better. And I moved uh, <laughs> in and around Cone Heights uh, before, during, and after the riots. And I think with that sort of backdrop, the first thing that we need to keep in mind when we're talking about black Jewish communities or black Jewish solidarity is that we're working with two invisible parentheticals. What we're really saying when we say black Jewish communities, we're saying parenthetical, non-Jewish, black, parenthetical, white Jewish communities. Yeah. It leaves out black Jewish, white Jewish community relations. It leaves out non-Jewish, black Jewish, black community relations. And unless we're working with all the pieces of that puzzle, we're never going to have a full picture because everyone's going to be talking past each other based on a false premise at the start in the first place. Um, when it comes to uh, recent anti-Semitic attacks, sort of sitting in that, I wouldn't say liminal space because it's its own world, but in that sort of bridge between non-Jewish black community and white Jewish community, uh, Jews of color, particularly African American or Caribbean descended uh, Jewish blacks are sort of caught in the crossfire. Uh, for example, in the recent uh, Jersey City attacks, um, some of us as Jews of color, both uh, private citizens and public personas, while trying to mourn with the rest of our Jewish community are also receiving anti-black backlash from the Jewish community. And we're one lovely exchange uh, after the Jersey City attacks uh, where someone said, Makas Choshech strikes again. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who don't know, if you remember your Seder, uh, Makas Choshech is the plague of darkness. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of narratives that are simultaneously happening. So when we're talking about uh, anti-Semitism and wanting people to disavow figures, the same needs to be reciprocated in Jewish communities also addressing anti-blackness and anti-black racism. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, for example, figures like Farrakhan, 
everyone jumps to Farrakhan like, immediately. I'm not sure what the Jewish community is going to do when he dies. <laughs> who they're going to prop up next as the next leader of the black people who is hugely anti-Semitic. Um, firstly, Farrakhan has to be taken in context. One, he is the only black civil rights leader that was a leader during the civil rights movement and made it out alive. So that's one source of, I guess, respect and sort of that uh, sort of frame of reference. But what also isn't acknowledged when there are these cries for, oh, disavow Farrakhan and et cetera, et cetera, it's removing from the equation that the Nation of Islam has consistently shown up to support historically underserved African American communities. And too often the voices disavowing him or saying remove him aren't also offering to replace the services that he and the Nation of Islam do. It's like saying you need to close that bodega because it's selling spoiled food, but also we're not going to open a shop right in your neighborhood once it closes down. So those two things can't happen at the same time. And simultaneously, there's never sort of that same outcry or mass disavowal of anti-black racism from legitimate leaders. Um, David Lau was a legitimate leader of the chief rabbi in Israel, but there was no huge disavowal when you referred to black people as monkeys. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure everyone has heard of Mamadnes, Rambam, but no one disavows that weird sentence that he has in Guide to the Perplexed when he says, those who are not able to attain higher spiritual values are the black colored people and those like them in their climates. Among the order of created things, their intelligence is less than a man, but more than a monkey. But we don't see things like that getting disavowed or being <coughs> sort of amplified. So that sort of have your cake and have, eat it too can't be a thing. If we're trying to build bonds with non-Jewish minorities, the things that happen in our own back, uh, backyard have to be addressed as well. Um, secondly, there's a lot of talk of, you know, black anti-Semitism, which isn't a thing. There's anti-Semitism, and then there are people with very ethnic groups that practice anti-Semitism. There's no so much thing as black anti-Semitism as there is black on black crime. It's just crime. Unless you're also going to take this on white on white crime, and Indian on Indian crime, and Asian on Asian crime. Unless we're talking about Asian anti-Semitism and Indian anti-Semitism, there's no such thing as black anti-Semitism. But if we're going to name it as black anti-Semitism, then regular anti-Semitism is also white anti-Semitism. And so while it might manifest the same way, white anti-Semitism and black anti-Semitism come from two fundamentally different places. And this is a space where being in dialogue with African American Jews is valuable because the basis of both anti-Semitisms is the conception of Jews being white. For white anti-Semitism, Jews are these surreptitious group of people that can infiltrate real white people and gain places of power and government and influence. Um, for African Americans, um, Jews are still white people, which James Baldwin addresses in his essay, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white, where he has uh, a sentence in this essay where he says, uh, the black reaction to the Jew is not because he is different from white people, but because he is the same because white presenting Jews, white Jews, the, what mainstream consciousness perceives as a Jew, uh, especially in interactions with minorities, uphold the same structures of white supremacies, um, benefit from the same privileges, and are able to enact the same prejudices as non-Jewish whites. And so from that perspective, black anti-Semitism, well, they're just another form of white person. So we need to identify those two differences, because if your house is on fire, it's a very different way of putting it out, whether it's a gas fire or an electrical fire. And if you use one method to battle the other, you're just going to make the problem worse. So that also needs to be addressed and come into dialogue with. And again, that's where African American Jews sort of have the keys to that, because we walk in both those worlds. And um, I, I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, please join me. Thank you, the panel. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start by opening it up, and then we'll come back, you know, to have some conversation around the table, because I really want to get a chance to, to hear from all of you. So uh, you can comment. You can you, please identify yourself, who you are, what community you're from, 
and you can talk a little bit about anything you want in your community, <coughs> what's working in black Jewish relations, or certainly ask a question to one of the panelists. So go ahead. Who wants to start? If not, I'll start, and then you well, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Linda Scherzer from uh, the uh, CRC director in Greater Metro West, New Jersey. And um, uh, Bob Kaplan, you are a, a true um, hero and, and model to all of us in the community relations field. My wife's not here yet. I <laughs> <laughs> take the microphone. Um, th this is, I mean, I thank you for uh, asking for remarks about what's going on in our communities. I mean, uh, I, I said, uh, told. Uh, Can you hear in the back? Yes. Yeah. So I spoke this morning at the plenary of a particularly, uh, 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 for me, a profoundly difficult issue that I've encountered in a, in, in an area of liberal progressivism where, um, you know, we in New Jersey uh, know that uh, African Americans and Jews have lived in, in, in um, you know, in, it's just been a wonderful example of tolerance and diversity. And we discovered that actually um, there is growing gentrification in the town, that there is um, a lack of affordable housing. And um, not long after Jersey City and Muncie, in a climate of, uh, of fear, anxiety um, in the Jewish community, a man gets up at a town hall meeting where they're talking about affordable housing, uh, an African-American man, and speaks to Jew, Jewish developers pushing um, low-income people out of his town and pointing to Lakewood, New Jersey, and Muncie, New York as examples of where uh, Jewish developers are, are buying up homes to bring in ultra-Orthodox people and forcing African Americans out of the town. And that rant was followed by a lot of applause. So clearly it had struck a chord in the community. And in the coming together afterwards, the mayor brought together African-American and Jewish clergy. I was invited in representing the larger Jewish community. There was a representative from the NAACP. What I discovered was um, African-American clergy who didn't really understand uh, why what this man had said was so offensive to, to us. Um, you know, my, my sense of it was that they felt that we were having a bad moment, um, but that they don't, we don't really understand what it means to experience racism and bigotry uh, because we don't live their experience. And, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get through that. Um, maybe this is one moment in time and doesn't really represent all that's going on out there, but, um, you know, I'll tell you, just three weeks ago in Washington, one of our members of Congress, an African-American, said to a group of 30 Federation leaders who had come to lobby and to talk about hate and anti-Semitism, he said, you know, you were there for us 50, 60 years ago, but you've moved forward and we've been left behind. And I, I think we're faced with a conundrum that I don't, perhaps I don't really appreciate, and I, I agree there's a dignity to... Um, the African-American narrative, but I, I, I'm trying to understand it, and I guess maybe it's a, a rant of my own, but what in your experience is the best way for us to to really get to know each other, to, to move this relationship forward in 2020? Okay. Uh, I think there are probably a lot of examples in this room, but do you want to comment on that? Uh, uh, I think this is somewhere where, again, the African-American voice is a great plug. Um, I'd like to start by saying that just because something is or feels anti-Semitic doesn't mean it's also true because two things can be correct at the same time. I can say from personal experience, having lived in Crown Heights, um, that, that rant um, sometimes is very true. I have an African-American Jewish acquaintance who still lives in Crown Heights, and when she was looking for an apartment in a building, she was told there were no vacancies. Okay? What the landlord didn't know is that one of the white Jewish tenants there was someone that she'd gone to yeshiva with. Mm -hmm. So she called her friend, and she got a call later in the day. All of a sudden, there are actually seven vacant apartments in that building. Mm -hmm. um, I know myself, uh, with my family, we've moved around to Midwood, to Crown Heights, to Mill Basin, to Sheep's Head Bay, and on the phone, oh, yeah, we're a Jewish family moving in, and then we come to the door, oh, the apartment was taken. Mm -hmm. So. There are concerted efforts 
to keep African Americans out of Jewish spaces sometimes. There are concerted efforts to sort of skirt, I mean, I live in New City in Rockland County, so I'm around Muncie and um, not Lakewood, what's the other one? Uh, Pomona, uh, places like that, where there are efforts to, one, um, <laughs> push out the mostly Haitian American families there, or Haitian, actually Haitian American and Mexican families there, move them out, uh, and to skirt county laws to create illegal uh, housing projects and settlements and things like that, and uh, redirecting funds in ways that shouldn't be redirected because they <coughs> grease the right pockets or they shut down criticism of those practices. Oh, they're being anti-Semitic, and this is another example, they are understanding of white life, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's not to say that's a true sort of rant in all cases, but it is a true enough that it happens enough that there is a valid core to that argument. So, <clears throat> about a year and a half ago, I got a cold phone call. We one of the methodologies we use in New York is we have put together these when when the crisis isn't there, it isn't present. Let's put it the way, that way. It's always the, <clears throat> the connect the lack of connections or the lack of uh, uh, respect or the lack of interface or proximity that we have has always been there. But we, we one of the methodologies. We, we put together in New York something called the We Are All Fellowships. We had one in Brooklyn called We Are All Brooklyn, and then we had one in the Bronx. We now have something called We Are All New York. Somebody who was in our original cohort of We Are All Brooklyn 15 years ago, her name is uh, oh, Trisha. That's not you. <laughs> Trisha O'Connor, she's a real estate uh, developer, a real estate person in the uh, Caribbean American community in East Flappish and Flappish and Crown Heights. She said, you know, I wouldn't, you would not believe what I'm hearing at some of these meetings that I'm going to, internal in, 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 in the community, uh, about the Jews and what's happening in these gentrifying neighborhoods. And she became sort of a, a, a bulwark against some of the stuff, but she says, you know, Bob, people that look a certain way, knocking on doors, ringing every doorbell, trying to buy this house, trying to buy that house, but she did say, it's not just them. There's Albanians, there's Asians, there's Arabs, there's this, there's that. Everyone's doing it. However, there is a issue of certain way people look, a certain the way people are, and the issue, and I think Shai's referred to this before, is that Jews are considered white folks. And by and and, and when I heard from a good friend of mine in another community, uh, um, Queens, a Queens Village, said sometimes they're considered the most you know, proximate white folks that we have to deal with. And it's something that, you know, again, dealing with the issue of, of the diversity of the Jewish community is that when you're talking about communities like the Hasidic community, where this is happening, and remember, and the yeshiva community, like what's happening in Ocean County. By the way, according to New York City planning, the two largest growing Jewish communities in the New York area are Ocean County, New Jersey, and Rockland County, New York. And who are populating these areas are Jews from Brooklyn. And why are they going to these areas? Because there's a lack of affordable housing in Brooklyn. Plain and simple, for everybody. So they're hitting the same fault lines that everyone's hitting. It's called gentrification. So if you see the spread and the, the growth of the Satmar community in Brooklyn, which went from 10,000 Jews in 1980 to now over 100,000 Jews, they have moved and moved and moved, and then they hit a certain fault line where they're up against the gentrifiers and they can't afford to deal with them economically. Or in Borough Park, where you see this huge, much bigger <coughs> ultra-Orthodox community that has hit two sides of their community. They can't expand because they've hit what they call the China Wall, and they actually call it that. On one end is, an, is a neighborhood called Bensonhurst, which used to be the premier Italian community mm -hmm. in Brooklyn. It's now the largest Chinese community in New York City. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Chinese will be the largest ethnic group in New York City, according to the city planning in the next seven to ten years. And on the other side is Sunset Park, which is another large Chinese community. Chinese communities, by the way, that don't talk to each other because they're from different parts of China. So everyone's got their issues. So, so what's happening is young people are having 8, 9, 10, 12 kids, 15 kids. The, the birth rate in those communities are sometimes five or, ten, five or six times 
the, not 10, but five or six times the normative birth rate in New York City for everyone else. They're looking for places to live. So where do they go? They're going to Staten Island, they're going to New Jersey, they're going to Rockland County. <coughs> Rockland County now has the highest percentage of Jews to non-Jews in the country, not just New York State, in the country. And the largest growing there are ultra-Orthodox Jews, and the majority of ultra-Orthodox Jews <coughs> happen to be Eastern European in their background. And that's just a birth rate issue. But more than a birth rate issue, it's a cultural clash. Because the white Jewish community of Eastern Europe that used to be politically center, left of center, is now in many cases being replaced by, in many parts of the city, by a community that is right of center and even more right of center, politically culturally and religiously. And it's a community that we as a Jewish, and I just, I'm going to use some thin ice terminology, the official quote unquote older Jewish community are just not comfortable with as well. To, uh, we did a, I'll just I'll be, I'll be quiet in a second. We did a training course for up and coming uh, 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 leaders in the UJA Federation on the ultra Orthodox community. At the end of the first session I said, here's my takeaway folks. You don't like them, and they, you think they don't like you. But the reality is, it's not that they don't like you. You are inconsequential to them. <laughs> you are inconsequential. <clears throat> you don't like who they are. And that gets translated out all over the place, internally and externally. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, let's go one here. Let's, we're going to take three. And, uh, so yeah, so I, I think... Um, You've laid out the realities and certainly the real estate quite well for us, but I don't have a sense of, so what do people of goodwill do to go forward? How do we make, uh, you know, we get the realities, we hear you, but now what? And, and New York isn't the whole country. So yeah, yeah. I want to, I want to, we think we are, but we're, we're really not. Susie and then David. Yeah, um, I'm from the Washington area, and a couple years ago, at a similar breakout like this, the question was asked, how many of the people in the room have family members who are people of color? And I'd like to see that, because in the like in this region, I, my grandchildren are half Filipino. Um, huge Asian populations in California, Hispanic populations elsewhere. And I'm just really curious to see sure. how we uh, How many people have... Uh, uh, people in their families who are people of color. Significant number. I mean, and that, yeah. it, it's, it, so, so, yeah, it really is. No, so I mean, I think, I think, I think that's an important reality. So the, so the question is, so my, so then my question is, <coughs> how can they be involved? How can we be involved in another way? Because we're not New York, and, 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 Okay. And we want to All right, so can I have everyone just do that again? I mean, that's not <laughs> 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 Raise your hands. Yeah, so raise your hand if you have a, a person of color in your family. Thank you so okay. much. Dr. Lukens. Uh, David Lukens, Orthodox Union. I'm, first of all, sitting here very humble at the power of our resolutions. We passed a resolution about eight years ago. The term ultra Orthodox was pejorative, highly offensive, was not to be used. All right, so we're using it all the time. <laughs> we lost on that one, I guess. And I'll reach on, reach on. I remember reach on. I'm deeply moved by your remarks. I identify the bad thing you said. In fact, I worked for Pat Moynihan, so I've been for 20 years. We were in Crown Heights in 1990 with the Lubavitcher rabbi, and he told us there's going to be blood flowing in the streets of Crown Heights if our neighbors are not getting their fair share from the government. Mm -hmm. So um, and six weeks later, they, six months later, there was. First of all, I'm a little surprised, stunned by you saying that Louis Farrakhan is the only surviving. Yeah. Civil rights leader. Somehow, I, I, John Lewis would be well John and be young. Mm -hmm. I hope you were protesting anything other than that. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're elevating Farrakhan. You're playing the same game that uh, us white racists. We're elevating Farrakhan. You're supposed to be black community. Yeah. Okay, that's first of all. Secondly, um, and I think I'm, I, I admire Bob Kaplan tremendously all the work he does there. He says, and, but you know, we just moved. We lived in New York City for 41 years. My wife and I moved to New Jersey. And for the last 10 years, we had constant had door bells ringing in the Bronx, ringing by Asians, by Italian Americans, offering us top dollar. And we finally sold 
It was a bidding war. It was literally a bidding war. It was once a Jewish neighbor in Pelham Parkway is now an Italian and Asian community. And we have a home in the Catskills. My wife got from her parents. And the doorbell rings. You know, whenever we're there, doorbell, we get phone calls, we get leaflets under the door from the Hasidim who are trying to buy it up. So again, I understand what it's like. I identify with that. But what, what troubles me is that I think we're painting with broad brushes here. New York City is half ultra orthodox the Jewish community. In, in, in 2011, according to the UJ Federation study, again, there Fort Royal, broad definition of ultra I assume I'm counted as ultra orthodox. Well, well, so let me, let, me, let me finish. So in 2011, the uh, UJ Federation study of, of the demographics of Jewish New York said that 40% of the Jews in New York City were defined as orthodox, with about 15% of that defining as modern orthodox. The, the vast majority were either Hasidic or what we <coughs> called yeshivish. Um, however, the hidden <coughs> figure there that really predicates what the future is going to look like is that 75, at that point, 78% of all Jewish children in the city of New York under the age of 18 were growing up in orthodox homes. Again, okay, so I, I, I know in this agency, in these circles, I am considered you know, in white orthodox, forgive me about the I'm considered, you know, a good orthodox Jew, and, but in, in the, and there are circles where I'm considered a shagist. At the same time, there's something called centrist orthodoxy, and I think it's bigger than people like to admit. We, you know, we lump the label of them together. It's true, black hats matter also. At the same time, you know, so I, I'm just hoping that in, in our effort to, you know, we're not lumping and jumping up things together. We have, we have a problem. We have a huge problem. And I know the Orthodox Union is deeply involved in addressing it quietly, not with press places, mind you, and Torah Masora, the problem of racism in the Orthodox community. It is real. It is tangible. It is, uh, it is indefensible. And you know what's pushing it the most? The white nationalists. Because that gives them an excuse. They want to turn the Jew against the black, and, and, and that way they get Jews to vote Republican and do all the other white nationalist racist things they want them to do. And we are pushing back against it. It's not simple. Okay, so I want to go back to Sue's. I would like Sue's. to talk to you more about that. Okay. That's all right. Anybody? I want to go back to Sue's very basic question, because part of what we're here to figure out today, and get it a little bit out of the New York Beltway, <laughs> the project that was in that Beltway. But, you know, because, again, we, we've got a diverse set of communities here who the New York reality is not the reality. So uh, I'd like to talk, uh, take it up a few notches and talk a little bit about some of the uh, strategies that what is working. And, and, and I'd, I'd open up to the audience, too. Um, but, you know, what is it and what to do? Um, I know from my experience, my humble experience both in Boston and nationally with National Council of Jewish Women, is that um, not having dialogue for dialogue's sake is really a good thing. But having uh, relationship building and proximity uh, so that we can work together on shared issues, uh, and we have a lot. And I think that has, in my experience, worked the best. And uh, not doing it during a crisis, by the way, because it's not during the crisis that you know that, that we look for statements and we look for support, but doing it every day. It's not like the, the crisis, it's every day building the relationships. And I think many of us have and continue to, and those relationships are real, and that's why when a situation happens, uh, whether it's an uh, anti-Semitic uh, incident in a community or, or nationally, in many cases, the black community has been one of the first to respond. So, you know, but I think there are concrete things that are happening on the ground mm -hmm. that have to do it. And, and, so, and so I, know, me, I know it's happening in, in your community, but I'm, I'm sure it's happening in communities across so, the So let me just a answer you just briefly. Um, and and I, 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 I understand that's why I said I'm talking through a New York lens. However, however, some of the methodologies I'm about to describe to you have been utilized in, in Germany, have been utilized in Australia, and other communities as well. We have incubated over 25 different community-based coalitions throughout New York on quality of life issues. We are we have changed the language that we use in New York from intergroup relations. I never knew what that meant, and I've been doing it for 27 years. What intergroup relations is, I have no idea what it is, but I do know what a shared society is. And shared society means sharing power. So that's something we are learning to do in New York. And we're learning to have our Jewish communal structure understand what it means to share power. It means sharing resources, 
uh, when uh, David Lukens was talking before about what the Lubavitcher Rebbe said about uh, getting their, uh, their equal uh, share. By the way, when they did the study after 1991, they found out that resources were actually shared. Perceptions are very powerful things. But we have to be able to share power and share resources. So when we, and that means you've got to hear the narrative of the other, and you have to be able to sit with them and figure out how we're going to share these resources on a localized level. So you do it around health care, you do it around other issues. But an issue that we need to, in New York, and again, it's a New York thing, we need to enter back into the issue of uh, public education, because most Jews in New York don't go to, don't go to uh, public schools anymore. Matter of fact, 80% of the Jew, Jewish kids in New York don't go to public school anymore. That's just the reality in New York. That's because 75% of our kids are growing up in Orthodox homes. That means they're predicated not to go to public schools. That means we have to create opportunities where we have proximity, where we can really hear what people are thinking and doing. And I'm not going to talk to the, the integration of, of Jews of color in the process because so we have folks that can do that better. But I have to be part of the process of making sure that that's, that's happening in everything that we do. So for instance, we just launched a new coalition on criminal justice reform in New York, a Jewish coalition on criminal justice reform, and getting folks integrated into the issue, even though it is a wedge issue right now following this uh, bail reform stuff. So it's going out there, really being part of communities, hearing the other's narrative, and seeing how we as a Jewish community, whatever that means, and however we define it, are part and parcel of a shared society. The woman out there who asked about what percentage of people in the room had people of color in their family, could you just pop your head up? Yeah. Hi. So you asked a little bit about sort of what the role then is as a family member. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much my life, so I'll speak to that a little bit. Uh, first, it is knowing and understanding and, and reading. So I'll give you an example. My daughter, a three-year-old black girl, is more likely to be expelled, more likely to be suspended, more likely to be, uh, you know, treated in disciplinary ways at school than her white peers for the same infractions of schoolness. I mean, she's a toddler, but you get what I'm saying. Um, you know, she's more likely to face violence from a police officer than a white adult male. So the first is knowing and facing the reality, and it's not fun, right? Like, realizing that you live in a safer world than your grandkids do is scary, and it's going to make you mad, really, really mad. <coughs> and that anger is a good thing. Cultivate it, and let it strive you to take action. And, you know, be calling your member of Congress, be calling your city council member, and saying, you know, I may have gotten involved in this issue a little later. I may have gotten involved with it because of my family. And, and, and that's my story. That's my story of why I care. And share that story because people need to hear it. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think that's the thing to do. Is start with education and the, the more you learn, the more pissed you're going to be. And, and then <laughs> cultivate that anger into action. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Joyce, did you yeah. have any comments? And then I want to uh, I want to go to Miami in the back so we get another community. I'd like to address my friend in the OU and your first question of what we should do. Um, when I was referencing Farrakhan as one of the only civil rights leaders that lived through it, uh, I was speaking more of the conception that we have of this big three sort of trifecta of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Farrakhan. It's not including like Stokely Carmichael or Megar Everett or John Lewis or et cetera, et cetera. We just have this sort of hierarchy of the big three and of the big three is the only one that sort of made it out alive. Um, to your question of like, what do we do next, how do we fix it? I'd say the short answer is just like being good neighbors. Um, in my community, Arkila, that we have, we have Shabbat Oneggs, we invite everyone from around the world, our nine Jewish neighbors across the streets, uh, the conservative, rabbi that lives like half the town away, the local reform one, the local Chabad, people who show up, show up, people who don't, don't. And we have sort of, you know, an open door. We've had, we've invited politicians over for Odex, some have shown up, some haven't, and just all the Jews in our, you know, neighborhood. Like, sure, we're a modern Orthodox congregation, but this is an event for Jews. Let's all be Jewish together on a Friday night. 
Um, a second point to that, um, when that question is asked, the what do we do or how do we, it has to be from a genuine place because too often, it's kind of like that scenario where there's like the college professor and like, you know, the hot student, professor, I'm filling this class and I'll do anything like this. <laughs> and it's like, anything? Oh, you can like uh, do this 20 page, like midterm paper, make it great. No, I don't, I don't think you understand, professor. I'll do anything. <laughs> well, well, I guess you could also have all your own work. No, I'll do anything. <laughs> so she has an end goal that she wants to get to and a path that she wants to take there. She's not really interested in productively getting to whatever point, and she has never guaranteed that what's being suggested is going to get her to that point. <coughs> and so I find some Jewish organizations are kind of like that girl, where there's a goal that they want to get to, and a path that they want to take, and they just want to hear you say it, as opposed to hearing, well, you know, do these papers, do these midterms, you might not get an A, but you won't be getting an F, and you might get a D. The class will still be there, you can take it over, don't worry, but you might have to do some hard work that might not get you to the goal that you want to do. Thank you. Carol in the back, Maybe Miami. It's been so long I forgot my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for reminding us as a former New Yorker that New York is not all of our communities. We know that Miami is very, very different. And I will ask a question of our panelists, because I was really taken, Carly, by how you laid out your five points. I was look, see if you could dig a little bit deeper yeah. about some models of being proximate that have worked, that given limited resources of JCRC and the CRCs around the country, something that we might be able to do, given that there's no heterogeneity in either the black or the Latino communities in, in many cities. If you can just give us a few nuggets. Sure. Um, and we're going to close with this, so I'm going to ask each panelist to give us a few nuggets. Uh, so that's what and, and I'm happy to hang around for a little. I know a lot of people had questions and didn't get to ask them. Um, there was a big study that came out a couple of months ago on Islamophobia in Western Europe, and it found two things. If you didn't have any Muslim neighbors, and you didn't have any Muslim coworkers, and you never met them, mm -hmm. you didn't see them as a plus, as a net positive for your country. Even if you had a Muslim neighbor and you never spoke to them, you just like saw them walking down the street and they were visibly Muslim, you were more likely to see them as a net positive. That obviously went up and up and up the more you spoke. So I, I think it's two things. Deep dialogue is really, really important. But not everyone can get there. And it takes, I don't know, a decade to get there to even get people to want to be in the room together. So it's also okay to like just, I loved what you were saying about Odeg, like have events and invite a lot of people. We're having a porn party. It's going to be a grand old time. You guys should all come. We'd love to invite members of our community. Or we're going to have a Shabbat with the whole community this year and invite people to come. So I... I love the emphasis on deep dialogue. I'm a big fan of it, but it takes a certain level of community relations already existing to get there, and it's okay not to be there. But the beginning of let's have joint events, it would be great to have you, we'd love to invite you over, can we set up a thing this year, it is a good starting point. Yeah. So let me tell you what I just did. Um, Talk about the proximate. Um, we're all, how many of you have taken leaders from other communities to Israel? All, that's, well, I've been on maybe 60 missions with Jews taking non-Jews to Israel. So I just spent uh, two and a half weeks in Israel on two pilgrimages with two African-American, Caribbean-American churches, one Haitian and one Caribbean. I was the other for a while. Sometimes you got to be the other. You got to hear what people are saying. You got to go into other people's territory. You got to step into their worlds and not always want people to step into your reality. You got to step into other folks' reality. You got to have some dialogues. I'm not talking about informal dialogues. You got to be able to hear what people are saying that are going to disturb. The bejeebers out of you, I'll be nice and use my language correctly. That are going to really scare you. You've got to be willing to be, a, as apropos to the conversation, a courageous leader and sometimes go up to your board, like I did a couple of years ago, and say, i got to be able to hang around with some people 
I got to be able to walk in some territories. I got to be able to interface with some folks that you find reprehensible because of all different kinds of criteria that you have. However, if we're going to be able to do this thing, if we're going to be able to interface with these folks, you're going to have to get comfortable with that, and you got to trust me. Well, the board eventually said yes. It didn't say yes right away. And I also had to speak the board's language. That means I had to know that they were not there with me. They were not professing the same belief system I was professing. They were prof professing fear and anxiety and anti-Semitism and scaredness. So I had to talk to that. I had to allay their fears. I had to talk to them about how this is going to make them safer. Is that where I was coming from? No. But if I didn't respect their narrative, I wasn't going to get further within the context of the Jewish community. So we have to be, just apropos to what you were talking about before early this morning, we've got to be courageous in what we do. We've got to step forward and we've got to stop trotting out, as, as Nancy started, the old paradigms as the symbol for the new paradigms. Farrakhan, old and in the way as far as I'm concerned. He spoke to a different world and a different generation. I know that he's speaking to some young folks today, but I'm not concerned about what he's doing. I got other folks that I need to deal with in, in communities that, that are feeling things about me that can affect me a lot more than Louis Farrakhan. Thank you. you know? Okay. Sorry. Those are the directions we've got to go in. Rabbi, Rabbi. Oh, I'm sorry, Colin. I just wanted to add one thing where I forgot to say that I think is really important. Be there on policy. Right. Um, the social stuff is great. I, I totally forgot that. Be there on policy and be there before you're asked and don't ask for anything back. Right. It's not like I showed up for criminal justice reform, now show up against BDS. It's not quid pro quo. It doesn't work. Be there on policy and relationships will come. And, and I would add that that's really easy to do because on yeah. policy we're really like almost 98% yeah. aligned on most of the issues we uh -huh. all care about. So I had, you know, I really think that we can be very effective on that. Last word. All right. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to really oversimplify what needs to happen because we talk a lot about otherness and how to work with people, how to make people feel welcome, how to talk to them. Um, we've all been to high school. We know what it's like to be the other. Even now, we know, and, oh, I'm, I'm the oldest person in this room, or I'm the youngest person in this room, or I'm the only brunette in this room, the only blonde person, the only person from New York, the only person here. We know what that otherness feels like, and we know what we would like to feel welcome. We've all done a group project. We know what it's like to work with people we don't want to work with. <laughs> it's taking those same paradigms, just applying them on a more macro level. We've all been around a family table during a holiday, and we do not agree on these certain points of whatever. But we're still a family, and we're not going to poison their food. We might, might want to, but we don't. That's, that's a crime. So, again, it's taking these things that we use in everyday life. We do this every day. Is applying it on a more macro level. Okay. All right. Well, that's food for thought. Thank you so much.